This is the Earth Sky Woman podcast with your host, Tammy Brunk. And happy full moon in Aries today. This is this full moon in Aries is featuring a, a powerful activation of the minor planet slash comet Chiron. And I, like so many astrologers, have a deep love affair with Chiron and the medicine that it brings um, that is not an easy medicine to swallow necessarily, but the, the heart of it, the heart of the medicine of Chiron, which is being transmitted to us today and which has been a, a very potent energy for 2020, is, is about those places where we are being invited to look and see, to look deeply from the soul perspective at where there have been places in our hearts that have gone numb, that have become cold, where we have abandoned aspects of ourselves, and or as we are called to see today, those places in our larger communities and culture where love has not permeated. It's time when Chiron is activated for us to fully open, surrender, and drop deep into that broken heart inside of us so that we can be made more human. And that's what's really been coming through for me as I've been sitting with and dancing with and steeping in the medicine and the mystery of this full moon in Aries. It's nine degrees um, Aries moon, the full moon that's going to be rising so bright and beautiful tonight in the night sky. And of course, then that means that the sun, which is opposite the moon, is at nine Libra. And so that's just a couple degrees from, uh, from Chiron, which is at seven Aries. And what I've been musing on, what I've been feeling and seeing so strongly for myself and in the world around me, is that we as humanity, as a species, are going through an experience of seeing and feeling and recognizing where our hearts have been numb. And I'm going to use some terms today that I don't often actually bring into this kind of a conversation because I try to create a space that feels safe. I try to create a space that feels gentle. And I recognize that there's a different frequency or a different energy when we go into those fields um, that can feel more political, um, that can cause us to want to put up our armor. And I don't ever want to create an environment because there's so much armoring I feel that we're all often feeling we need to do. I want to um, create a space where our nervous systems can settle. So those terms that I'm going to be speaking into, however, um, is that the reality that the world we live in, particularly here, here in the U.S., this modern construct is a construct that is a white supremacist um, reality. And many of you know this already, so this isn't something that is news. Um, but what's happening as we wake up more and more to that reality is that we begin to recognize um, at a deeper and a deeper level what this system that favors some bodies and some skin tones over others, what this is doing to our collective soul. And here in the U.S., uh, our hearts have been breaking open more and more. We hope some have been hardened, but many others are being cracked open wider and deeper by the very clear recognition that we have a white supremacist in office and that he more and more boldly and unapologetically is calling this out, even um, on the recent debate stage. And, um, and so this is a moment where uh, when we look back at this moment in history, it's my dream, it's my vision and that of many of us that we will look back and we will say, this is when everything changed. This was the moment when this legacy that has been carried in this country 
here in the US and Turtle Island, this legacy of racism and of colonization, it shifted. Enough hearts were broken open that we changed our trajectory, that enough of us saw, felt, and understood deeply and clearly enough that our own well-being and our own um, wholeness and the future of our nation is dependent on ourselves coming into a greater capacity for compassion, for empathy, and for putting ourselves into the um, really the proverbial like standing in the shoes as much as we can, standing in the body of our black brothers and sisters and communities of color. That if we are, and those I, I'm speaking to here are in white skinned bodies, that we're learning to reach out beyond our comfort zones to see our see what our what our black sisters and brothers are going through and what they have been going through and recognizing there's simply no way out of there's no way to move forward in our culture without addressing this and reckoning with this inside of ourselves and outside of ourselves and currently what that means is um, that we absolutely must do all that we can in the ways that we have at our disposal, which are energetic, as well as physical, um, material. So some of us, the work that we do needs to be more energetic, more spiritual, and um, also for many of us, the work is material. To ensure that this cycle of um, blatant, overt, misogynistic and racist and white supremacist um, leadership is, is um, brought down, is laid low because it's absolutely no longer, um, we simply will not let it stand. So when we look back at these moments and at these months that we say that this was the critical juncture where it changed, that's what my vision would be and many others. And I wanna to speak to it a little bit. I know there are many of us who are, who are listening, who are like me, who are um, women with light skin, with, with, who, are, who are white um, and who are going through a tremendous amount right now. Um, and I just want to send so much love, just waves of love to everyone who is experiencing tremendous loss, whether that come in the form of loss of loved ones, whether that come in the form of economic hardship and uncertainty of the future, whether that come in the form of loss of relationship, whether that come in the form of just a tremendous heart sickness over the um, massive effects of climate change and our beautiful Northwestern forests, whether that come from the place of seeing and feeling and connected so deeply um, heart to heart with the people, the indigenous peoples in the Amazon who are continuing to fight to preserve these rainforests that are the lungs of our entire planet for our species and so many others. So just standing with you from that place of Chiron that recognizes that we all, we are all a part of this great unfolding and that there is so much that is on the surface now sending love and tenderness for each of your hearts for the places where you might feel exhausted and that is um, that is a very real reality for many also wanting to hold space for wanting to honor and acknowledge and uplift each of those of us who are because of external or internal um, climates, experiencing profound joy, experiencing incredible ecstasy, and, and experiencing love at a level that's never been felt before, experiencing such a sense of wholeness and rightness and alignment with one's sole purpose, just wanting to create a field of inclusivity for all the human experiences that we're having. Wherever you stand right now, at, at home in the truth of where you live, in your body, honoring that experience now, that that is what, when you come home to the reality uh, and the truth of, of what, what is happening inside your body, your psyche, your soul right now, 
um, resting in that, honoring that. Because what I see, feel, and know for myself, and I see, feel, and know in the world around me is that when we abandon, when we reject, when we say that's good and this is bad, um, and we play, we, we, meaning those parts of ourselves, we reject and we, we have a cold place or a numb place within us that um, we have not allowed love to enter into that space. Um, there is a fragmentation that happens. And I say that even now, as I just a moment ago was um, speaking into what's happening in the highest office of this nation and the systems that we all exist within. I do want to also honor that as some of those indigenous elder voices that I most um, am most deeply moved by, as wisdom voices would say, Donald Trump is also our uncle. He is also a part of the human family. He also represents a part of each one of us that has been emboldened, that has been strengthened, and that we could say is the part of ourselves that is so deeply wounded and fragmented that it has forgotten her or his humanity, forgotten his or her connection to the whole. And this is something that is heartbreaking to see, whether it's someone outside of ourselves, even more heartbreaking for each of us, where we see the places where we've become numb, where we've become cold, where we've forgotten our humanity, because this, my dear listeners and friends, is a trend that is, it is a, it's an impulse, it's a, a reality that in every, each and every moment of our lives, we are being asked to choose whether we, <sighs> whether we be presenced with what is inside of ourselves and in our lives and in our world, whether we are willing to remain rooted and grounded in our bodies and in our vulnerable hearts and in our fierce love, whether we're willing to remain at home in ourselves then, or whether we choose sometimes in very subtle ways to leave, um, to leave the, the scene of the crime, to leave the situation that has become too painful. And I wanna honor that sometimes that's the right thing to do. What's challenging, however, is that when it comes to being in a white body, and I'm speaking to the white body people here, but also I recognize and acknowledge to my sisters and brothers of color, you, we've all been influ influenced by the system. So there is a coldness, there is a coldness that is rewarded in our culture. There is a coldness of heart that um, is empowered in our culture. And that is what's killing our souls. And it shows up often in a profit motive. And when I say that, I am not in any way opposed to people thriving. Uh, I believe that we live in a time where it is actually quite possible for each and every one of us to thrive materially, spiritually, emotionally. I believe that because I believe and I've seen for myself time and time again, that this universe will offer to us um, whatever is most needed. However, that coldness, when I speak to the prophet motive, has to do with something, has to do more actually with that fear that there's not enough, that, that what's available is scarce, that what is out there is insufficient, and so there is this kind of grasping, this clinging that we do that, um, that shuts down our hearts and that puts our focus in a direction that is opposed to, um, opposed to true connection with our, own, um, with our own tender hearts and with each other and with our true purpose and with our, um, our soul self. Which is, which is wise, which is um, connected, which understands that um, whatever is happening 
to my black sister over there is something that is, it is, um, I am connected to her. I am a part of her. She is a part of me. And so if we live in a system where there's widespread injustice, specifically towards certain groups, um, there's no a way that I can go to that's going to, um, unless I somehow put into my own personal equation the well-being of this sister. I'm going to give an example of that because um, in everything that's been happening with COVID, with the economy, 2020, just craziness on all levels, I know that it's very easy um, to become, again, so exhausted and frayed sometimes with everything that's needing to be tended, that it's hard some, if we are in white bodies, it can be difficult to, um, to not have a little part of our psyche say, but I'm tired, but it's too much. How can I be expected to also look at um, these larger social justice issues? It's, it's, it's too much. I can't handle it. So whether or not we want to admit it, that can happen sometimes. And what I want to say to that part of me, that part of my heart that gets cold, and that part of your heart perhaps that gets cold, that wants to, to take care of your family and yourself, and that's not a bad thing, that's a natural thing, it's a good thing. But that part of yourself that thinks, that believes that there's only enough resource, whether that's energy, time, whatever, for your own and insufficient for the, the reality for, for those sisters and brothers outside of your sphere of immediate connection, um, that the truth is, is that um, there is sufficient because this is actually what we're being called to do right now. We're being called to look um, more deeply at what our actual resources are. And here's the thing. We each have, when we connect into source, when we are fully accessing the tools, the awareness that we've been given, and you know, everyone here listening has had access to spiritual practices, has had access to mentorship on different levels, has had access perhaps to the wisdom, the unconditional love of Mother Earth. Um, we've all had access to, to strength, strengthening um, resources around us that if we were to fully plug into those, and if we were to fully plug into the reality, the, the true reality that we are supported and loved at all times, we would have sufficient resource in order to extend beyond ourselves into um, making our worlds more interconnected, reaching beyond our comfort zones so that we be sure that part of our lived day-to-day -day experience is contributing to creating a more just and fair society. And um, I just want to share the story when it comes to something, for example, like COVID. You know, I, it wasn't long ago, it was a couple months ago, I'm pretty sure I could have written something on Facebook, put it out there that said, who here has um, been diagnosed with COVID? and or who has a friend or a loved one that they have lost to COVID specifically. And I would have had very, very few. You know, I have almost 4,000 people on Facebook and I would have had very, very few individuals who would have lost someone or had COVID themselves. Very small number of people. Um, on the other hand, even as far back as in June, when I spoke with a dear friend who is a woman of color, she's a black woman in an urban community, um, in Detroit, she had, this was, I believe, back in June, she had already lost at least five people who were very close to her to COVID. And she had a circle of, I would guess, probably at least 20 or so other individuals, each of whom she told me have probably lost at least that many. So, you know, that's one example. And just to know as well, I have another friend and a wonderful human who is my hairdresser. She's a young African-American woman. Um, as I we were talking about what's been happening in her world, the reality for her is that she has two young kids she's raising. She has a young son that she's adopted who is a young African-American man who, um, you know, had, didn't have a mother in his life, didn't have a stable home structure, structure, so she took him in. And she's been a mama and a mentor to him. 
and she's also created a group for young African-American women to be mentored. She also, she and her mother have helped to create kind of a, a community center context for, um, for, for black mothers to, because there are so many in these communities and it's not just African-American women, let me say this. It's also, it's important to recognize that, that many individuals in our current system have fallen through the cracks, white or black. Uh, because of the current economic system and the predatory nature of that, that there are many individuals right now who are having to choose between um, sending their children to school, impossible choices. They, they, we, know, we all know this, you know, are you gonna work? Are you gonna send your kids to school? And if you come from a working class or a poor kind of family, you're in a terrible situation right now. So she and her mother have helped to create a, a situation where, um, young people, uh, kids in her neighborhood can be taken, can be supported with a retired teacher um, who is available in this community center. And because that's the need in her community. So what I see with that is a couple things. We can learn, uh, those of us who are not coming from um, this kind of collectivist culture, because really white culture has been, we have been colonized for longer a much longer period of time where, in a sense, I would say it's like our hearts have been a little frozen. And this is a very painful thing for us. And so because of that, we have been immersed in this kind of traumatized culture for longer, where we've become much more adept at kind of separating ourselves and boundarying ourselves from those who are vulnerable and in need. And so because of that, we have lost our seeming capacity to to gather ourselves and to take action to support each other in a more natural and flowing way. Um, I, and I think part of that, this is, and I don't want any of this to feel like it's a, about um, guilt and shame. You know, I don't think there's anything beneficial to be gained. I think actually judgment, guilt, and shame are the three energies that we as, you know, again, I'm speaking to my white sisters and brothers, that we have been immersed in that is the core wound, shame, guilt, judgment, um, that those are the energies that actually cause the most profound closing of our hearts. So that's not the medicine I am suggesting or proposing for us. I think the first step is actually to look and see when we feel exhausted and tired and we feel like it's too much to consider what is occurring in the larger field of our society and our culture. Um, some of that is simply that we need breaks. Some of it is simply that yes, we need to um, be a human being and have fun and play and make music or do whatever the things are that bring us joy without necessarily having everything be focused on looking at what's wrong, like that's part of it. The other reality though too, I think is that um, if we feel under-resourced, the chances are pretty good that we are ourselves um, experiencing the kind of oppression and the kind of injustice and the kind of brutality inside of our psyches, inside of our hearts that we see playing out in the world around us. And so there's something, you know, there was a really profound, had a really interesting experience a couple of weeks ago that was pretty humbling for me where I had reached out to a an individual who, whose work I've been following, it lights me up, it's, it's really inspiring to me. And he's this young, I've talked about him, African-American um, mystic, you know, and healer, he's a miracle worker. And he had a course that was coming out that was for people who have supernatural skills. And he's talked about people who can bilocate or people who can, you know, travel through time, like um, time bin and things like this. And I do have some experience and some skill set in some of those areas, not by locating, <laughs> but um, specifically in working with time and bending time and some of the qualities around that and some of the, um, the very real capacities around that I've been building and working with for years now. But what I said to this individual was, I said, you know, I, I'd be interested in your course, but I'm not so sure that I'm quite there yet. So he ended up calling me and we had a long conversation. And um, so after that conversation, I said I would give it some thought if I wanted to join his program or not. About a week later, he reached out to me again because his program was about ready to start. 
and um, we had another conversation. Meanwhile, I'd been in a place where my heart was feeling pretty heavy. Um, and I go through those phases where my inner patriarch is incredibly big and it's brutal and it beats me up every day. And um, some days I'm better at, at really um, holding it at bay. Sometimes I'm better at that battle of consciousness of standing in the power of who I am as divine. And these days leading up to my conversation with Joelle, we're not that. These days were, I was feeling pretty bloodied inside. And what that looks like for me is I get really super serious. There's no playfulness. There's no joy. There's no, you know, joy um, in living in me. And I talked about this in a recent video too. Um, but so what Joelle said was, you know, when you have a conversation with Joelle, what will happen is he'll get real quiet for a little while and you know that he's consulting his guide. So it's like, Oh God, what are they saying to him? <laughs> and, um, and basically what he said to me was he asked me, he just said, you know, how much of your day do you spend just living in the reality that divine, that source, that the infinite loves you, just loves you, no matter what it doesn't matter what you do like you don't have to do anything but you're just absolutely unconditionally loved how much of your day-to-day -day experience are you open to that level of love from source and and living in the knowledge of that connection and it floored me you know it just um If there's anything that I've become very passionate about in these last months, years, it is that spirituality can be used to bludgeon us. And it has been used as a weapon. The kind of spiritual and religious conditioning that many of us have received has act actively severed our connection to source. And this is something that Joelle had helped me to see in that moment. And I know I did not intend to um, go to this place, but so be it. Thank you, Chiron. Because when he asked me that question, I realized how rare that experience was for me and how deeply embedded in my psyche is this belief that in order to be loved by divine, by God, goddess, I have to be continually proving myself that there is something about me that is inherently flawed that has to be corrected. And so much so, um, you know, and so, so this is the dilemma. My um, friends um, who are of all colors, white, black, brown, red, it doesn't matter. This is the reality we've been steeped in, and it's so close to us, we can't even see it. And that is that, for some of us more recently, and for some of us as much as a thousand years or more ago, our ancestors who had a relationship with the world that was alive, that was sentient, that was conscious, that was magical, and of which our, our ancestors were an intimate part of the fabric of creation, that tie was severed. And that connection, that intimacy of all of life, and living in a culture that was a partnership-based culture, that was broken and it was replaced with cultural paradigms and norms that were abusive, that were dominator cultures. And, you know, I was once again reading Rianne Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade, and appreciating once again how her seminal work written in the late 80s was something that was so absolutely essential and that's been forgotten for many of us. Um, which was about introducing the idea that it's not always been this way. 
there still remain some cultures that are partnership-based cultures. Cultures where women and men both have healthy roles that are equally dignified and reverenced. Cultures where babies and women and elders are deeply nourished and cherished and cared for. Cultures where there is such an intimacy with the natural environment that we understand that, that we are an extension of Earth's intelligence and the love and the, and the feeling of, of relationality with the Earth around us and its many parts, including our ancestors, remains vital and potent and real. Cultures where each human being's capacity as an artisan as an individual who has something potent and vital to contribute is nourished and nurtured. Those cultures have always existed and we all come from root cultures who have those qualities. And we all carry at the heart of our being a remembrance of what it looks and feels like to live in cultures and to live with the consciousness that of, of peacemaking, a peaceful culture, a partnership-based culture where we can actually trust one another and we can trust the motives of um, our fellow villagers that we are actually here to uplift and nurture and care for each other, that that is the general way. Not that there aren't always human qualities or tendencies that are needing to be um, honed and refined and called out in a loving collective way, um, but what we're living in right now, this is not, this is not the pinnacle of human capacities as a culture. What I would say is I want to honor, I also want to honor that for all the darkness we feel right now, it is always the truth that there is equal light. There is great light. There is, and so interesting, I say darkness and light, right? Um, interesting choice of words. So when I say darkness, oh, yeah, we're right there, aren't we? Just right there. I think many of us are um, in this place where we're recognizing that there are different frequencies when it comes to dark and there are different frequencies when it comes to light. And there is such a thing as light that can be profoundly damaging, profoundly distancing, and it's related to that coldness of heart that we have inherited as a culture and that it's time for us to break open into deeper um, vulnerability and to remember our innate humanity, compassion, empathy, and care. There are also vibrations or frequencies around darkness that I often think of as being somewhat like the difference between healthy compost when it has enough oxygen and can break down the nutrients so that it can create something beautiful and vibrant. It does, you know, even if it's got that oxygen, that compost still will go through a phase where it looks pretty putrid and it can smell pretty stinky. And that's part of the process that we're needing to learn how to honor and acknowledge. Um, and at the same time, there are processes that can break those things down much more elegantly and easily. And it involves oxygen, it involves the right alchemy, alchemical procedures to break down um, the poop and the, the, the old refuse into something usable. Um, so there's, there are aspects of darkness there are aspects and frequencies of darkness that are toxic. There are aspects and frequencies of unconsciousness that cause great harm. And then there are frequencies of light and there are frequencies of dark that are a beautiful, a potent, a gorgeous dance that wants to live inside of each of us in balance and in um, co-creative synergy. So we live at what you could say is the, the, the heart or the, the turning of the Kali Yuga, the dark age. Dark meaning a time of unconsciousness. And so with that turning of an age that we live in the midst of, it is time for us to remember what it means 
to be a true human, what it means to look deep inside our own hearts and our souls to begin and say, where do I have cold places? Where is it that I am continuing to step into or drop into a place of unconsciousness where I unknowingly abandon myself, abuse myself, refuse to stay present and dignify my own life, my own story, my own experience, my own, where I find myself right now, where am I rejecting that? And where can I begin to bring more grace? Where can I begin to bring forgiveness? Where can I begin to bring that heat of this beautiful Aries Chiron full moon to melt the icy places in my heart where I first turned away from myself, where I first chose to care more about what other people think, to care more about pleasing outside of myself, to care more about the way I think I'm supposed to be and look than what my own soul and my own heart cries out for. And so I would just, I just, my deepest desire for each of us right now is to take a moment in this full moon window over the next couple of days to really deeply scan and drop down into the places where we have a coldness of heart around ourselves, around the deeper aspects of who we are. And if we can let that melt, if we can surrender to a melting and a breaking open and um, a healing of those cold places, then what we become capable of bringing into the world around us, the level of love, the level of compassion, of empathy, of constructive, loving, caring hands, of just innately coming to recognize because spirit is speaking through us, is animating us as it's such natural thing for her to do, that we will naturally find our way to contribute to the world around us because we're at home. We've summoned our souls home. So let's find that place of deeper healing, constellation of wholeness and coherence within ourselves by turning our loving eye and our attention to what it is inside of us that needs that, that strength, that needs that warmth, that heat of melting, that heat of surrender, that heat of homecoming to our own, our own tender and magnificent selves. And from that, let us flow out into the world to bring the heat of our fierce love, the heat of our fierce remembrance of who we truly are into the world. And I want to also offer as I complete that I have opened Unleashed. It's a seven week journey. It began this last Tuesday. I'm keeping it open until Tuesday, the um, October, oh gosh, what is it? The sixth? Today's the first. Sixth. <laughs> I believe it's October sixth. Um, so I'm going to keep it open until the sixth, and I've got a few more spots left. So if you want to join Unleashed, this is a program that's all about helping each one of us to bring alive that Aries energy that helps us to actually springboard beyond the mind that can be so punishing into the, the higher calling that we are each here for, into that vitality, into that fire, into that passion of what it is that we are here to bring into the world. And so it's a container. This is a container that I've been creating and the beautiful circle that's gathering is incredible and potent. And we are choosing to create a container where we bring alive and blossoming in a safe space, those deeper and more tender visions and dreams that we wish to bring alive in the world around us. It's a safe enough container that whatever comes up as we begin to move towards those visions can be held with love, with tenderness, even as we continue to return once again, again and again and again into what is true for us and what wants to emerge and be birthed. Um, so this is a seven week container, six week if you join by this coming Tuesday and you are welcome to check that out. And if you feel resonant, if you feel that Aries whole, holy fiery yes, then please, please join us. And we look forward, I will look forward to seeing you there. And for all of the rest of you, 
um, so much love and may we um, absolutely drop in, may we absolutely extract and stand in the medicine of our whole and wholly healed souls and hearts in this great crucible of this brilliant Aries full moon with Chiron in 2020. So much love to each of you.